Okay, so Neil Anderson from Flatbox and Digital Revolver here. I have got Matt Lieb with me, a titan of industry. <laughs> but I will let I let Matt tell you a bit about himself. All right. Um, yeah, Matt Lieb, somewhat less than a titan of industry. Um, been though in it for a long time. You can tell by the very gray face. Um, Right now, I work for Connection Enterprise, uh, where I am a what's known as a TSE, uh, basically a uh, an architect. But um, I solve business problems with technology, whereas many of our solutions architects solve technological problems with technology. And it's good to have those separate sort of approaches. Uh, been in the industry for many, many years. Graduated college and forgive the helicopter since some. Um, just, just as an FYI, we're outside the the Delano in Vegas at the NetApp Insight Conference. So the background noise, this is as quiet as we could get it. Um, I started my career in 1986 managing the computer department at a Radio Shack. And then for many years, uh, I ran the VMware environment at Zurich Insurance. I've worked for a couple of consultancies, including my own. Um, and then I've also worked at uh, some of the larger vendors in the industry, including VMware and EMC in the past. Right now, though, uh, Connection is a value-added reseller, which is a term I don't much care for, a systems integrator. And, and we are um, really concentrating on making sure that our customers get the, the best solution for their needs which could have a million different um, touch points. Their needs could be how much it costs. It could be um, a storage solution that supports object or, or offloads to the cloud. It could be any number of, of particular solutions. And uh, it's my job to sort of suss out what those needs are and come up with a technological solution that helps them get where they want to go. Cool. OK, so let's. Let's talk a bit about your career history. So you must have seen a lot of changes occurring over the years. Yeah, well, what's, what, what's the main changes you've seen? Well, you know, I, I guess that the biggest sort of change in, in this industry over the course of the last 10 or 15 years is the advent of the cloud and how virtualization specifically has impacted all of those changes. Um, and, and certainly it's a big talking point for me and for my customers, and that's how do I get myself from where I am in my traditional on-premises data center into uh, a hybrid solution or, or even in certain cases uh, an all-cloud-based, uh, cloud-native uh, scenario. Um, lately, I've been having a lot more conversations on how do I bring some of those cloud-based apps back into the data center uh, for whatever objection they may have. And, and a lot of the time, those objections are cost-based because certainly we know that those services don't come free. Yeah. So a thing with that, I mean, like when you first got into the industry, I came in a little while after you. <laughs> not, yeah, not that much after. You know that if, if you're working in a kind of data center environment or a large corporate environment, mm -hmm you had fixed roles, right? Like you would have the networking team, you would have the storage very team, silent, yes. you would have maybe the Windows team or operating system, very solid. And people generally just worked in their particular role. So if you were gonna be making a career there, you knew what you had to learn. I think now it could be quite, seem quite overwhelming if you were coming into industry now because there's so many things that you yeah. need to learn about I think technology is making a big change, though, in, in how we do approach those things, right? It's easier to provision storage. I can remember the first Symmetrics I worked on uh, was a DMX4. Provisioning alone was a, uh, you know, a multi, multi-step process, and learning how to do it took days. Um, and you only got used to it if you did it on a regular basis. Um, today, to hook up a, an all-flash array to your Ethernet network and get it working within your VMware environment, 
you can do in, I don't know, less than an hour. And that's not as a solutions architect. That's, that's the guy who sort of racks and stacks in your data center. Um, so yeah, you're right. It was very siloed, and and certainly, the virtualization side was the one that I specialized in initially. In fact, I was actually one of the first five thousand VCPs, uh, version two eleven of VMware. How, how many are there now? We're in six point seven X, but how, how many VCPs? There's a lot. Hundreds Tens of thousands, thousands, of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Absolutely, now. yeah. Um, and and I don't even think the VCP is a current accreditation it's a vcap something right um, and and i've tried you know tried to do my best to maintain some of those validations and, and certifications but i don't know necessarily that the from a from a knowledge perspective the certification means as much as the understanding of the underlying architecture right i have a, a vcap nfv for nsx for example i'm no network expert you're the network expert right but I understand how to implement the solution and sort of what the best ramifications and use cases are of it. Um, do, did I need my VCAP for that? Probably not. But now, let's be fair, we both work in the channel and in the channel, our employers get better response from the vendor if we have more people with those certifications. So it's, it is important in some ways. Um, I started working with VMware when all it was was GSX. And we had a great solution for some of the developers that we had. I, I at the time, was running um, basically tech support at a uh, Panasonic factory automations company at that point. We were manufacturing um, uh, chip inserting machines and logic board uh, stuff, as well as the, the devices that you see in automobile factories. Uh, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and each one of these devices was run by a Windows NT4 based application. Every time the code generator created something that blew up the workstation, all we do is deploy uh, a fresh image into the workstation concept from a template that sat on that machine. So it was a really quick solution Obviously, VMware has gone quite a bit beyond that at this point, but, but really, it was life-saving for us. Otherwise, we'd have to fully image every machine every time that code blew up the, the desktop. Um, I've done more projects than I can even imagine, from virtualizing all of AMD, AMD many years ago, and that was probably the first big VI3 project. Uh, I've architected... Um, some of the largest VDI environments in the world. That's back when I worked for EMC. Um, and, and really love the challenge. It, it becomes the, the kind of ammunition and fuel that, that drives me, um, which is one of the reasons I like working in the, in, the, um, in the channel side of the operation. I get to choose what I believe are the best solutions for the needs that the customer has without having to isolate myself to a particular product line to do it. Um, sometimes that is correct though. Sometimes the customer says, all I want is an AWS cloud solution. And so my hands are tied in certain directions about how I can help them approach that. Um, but that's their decision, not mine. So like something you just said was about certification, and for us, you know, both of us have been working in the IT field for a long, long time. So, you know, if we're if we're going to be talking either to a potential employer or a customer or really anybody, they're not going to care so much about certification for us because we've got so much experience. How about people that are? just looking to break into the IT field now. So they're not even working in IT yet. It's what, funny. and I don't, like, I don't want to lead you into an answer here and say, oh, do certification. I mean, what, what would you advise people that are looking to break in right now? I think it's a really tough avenue to, pers to, to break into. Um, and I do think that actually getting a key cert can help you, gives you some credibility in the avenue you want to pursue. And, and I've recommended that in the past. 
you know, when I started out, the people that were doing networking were people that were setting IPX networks up in their home so they could do gaming with their friends. And a lot of those guys got really good at binding protocols to network cards and, and setting up, you know, quick networks so that they could do their RPGs or I don't, I'm not a gamer, so I don't really know what they, uh, what those are, but, um, some of those guys were fantastic. Um, you know, some people get into the systems architecture through generating code and you can teach yourself to code even some of the newer interesting high-level languages but I think that the best advice that I could possibly give to somebody looking to break in although again certifications are important is to pursue your passion to, to take whatever Avenue makes the most sense for you um, you know I was telling you earlier today I think it was at breakfast about a, a very key conversation I once had about uh, my my career was foundering a bit and I, I just didn't know how to pursue this upcoming job search and I sat down with um, with Kat Troyer um, and Kat she's an unbelievably well thought through career advisor among many other positive um, attributes and she said to me essentially what do you like doing? Not what are you good at? What do you like doing? And that gave, got me thinking in that direction. And, and by knowing what I liked doing, I was able to actually take a, a mild turn in what I actually was doing away from the engineering, which had gotten somewhat mundane for me, and into sort of the advocacy side, the, the assistance in architecture to my customers and it really made a, a big difference for me um, I also write a lot and and she asked me do do you like writing I said actually the truth is I would love to write full-time I, I don't know how I could monetize that and and pay for you know putting food on my table she said well maybe you can incorporate it into what you already do and that has helped to customize my approach towards my blog, develop a more unique voice. Uh, I think that the people that read my stuff understand that what they're going to be getting from me is not the knob turning nuts and bolts stuff, but more of the overarching goals of, of a particular piece of technology and, and the solutions it might bring to, into play. Um, and that's not to say that that other side of the equation isn't every bit or even more so as valid it's just that what I want to communicate is is that side of the sort of the features advantages and benefits of why you might choose this technology over another as opposed to how do you get this particular piece of technology to tweak to the highest extent or something along those lines and so I pursued my blog in the direction I wanted to as well um, and it's about following, I know it's so cliche, but following your bliss. Because the happier you are doing something, whether you're doing it for yourself or for someone else, the better you're going to do it, the more value you're going to bring to the table. And um, hopefully other people will see that value as well. Yeah, I've seen, something I've seen sometimes over the years is, you know, people chase the money sometimes. I don't think that makes you happy. Like you just said, you know, well, if you if, do what if you are, it helps, but if you if you're like if you're in a really high paying job that you hate, you're not gonna be as happy as if you're doing something that you love, getting whatever so I don't that pays. Disrespect anybody who chooses to pursue the money. Especially if the money is what makes them happy. Right? And and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I mean where it gets wrong is are you taking advantage of people in order to earn your money? And, you know, I'm, I know it sounds Pollyanna, but I just don't like to take advantage of people. Uh, that is, and I know it's yours too, but that is how I approach these things. I, I want to help. I want people to see me as a, as a part of their team, right? I want them to feel that when they open up a dialogue with me about a particular piece of technology or a particular whatever, 
that they're going to get a a well-reasoned and insightful answer um, and that ultimately if they choose what I have recommended to them that they're going to come back again and they're going to continue to use the company I represent um, and, and lean on me from my technological perspective and I've done you know all I do is try to learn about new stuff and and you know we talked about scriptotherapy also and that is writing about it as I write about a particular piece of technology or or whatever it is um, to me it helps me to think about who might benefit and how they might benefit um, and then it's written so I can just say to my customer well, let's talk about XYZ brand of storage. And in fact, if you're really interested in it, here's a blog post that I wrote. Here's another one that my friend wrote that talks about this stuff. And we have different perspectives, but we're giving you sort of a well-rounded view. Or here's a video from a, a field day or a, or a tech day that I attended where the speaker speaks most eloquently about this particular piece of technology. And, and that knowledge not only of, of what we do as connection enterprises, but what the vendors do and what my peers are doing and what the field day events do and, and the people presenting, um, it's, I think, invaluable as, as not only a resource for me, but for my customers. Okay, so the, the last question I asked was for advice for people just entering the industry. Oh, that's true. No, so I was just going to see, I was going to like, this is my segue into the next one, which I just thought is how about, because like a, I get emails on pretty much a daily basis, either, either the reason I ask you that is I get people that are looking to break into the industry asking for advice. Another one I get is people that have just done refer certification. So maybe on the networking side, we've done the Cisco CCNA, or on the storage side, we've maybe done the NCDA, or a, 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 another uh, vendor qualification like that. And then they ask me, okay, I've done this, what should I do next? That question comes up all the time. Well, you know, there, there's value to, to having those certs. But a cert without practicing that technology is not going to get you anywhere. And you're going to be asked, you know, in your interview process, say you've got your NCDA, you know your customer or your interviewer is a NetApp shop. If you answer PAT questions taken specifically off that NCDA certification, you're not really giving any value beyond, I mean, let's try to approach, my, one of my favorite words is parsimony. And um, it's kind of like an Occam's razor philosophy. If you hear hoofbeats, you don't think zebras, you, you think horses, right? So the idea is if a, say an endpoint has lost connectivity, right? I, and I was asked this question once in an interview. Um, what's the first thing you do? Well, I guess I'd probably sit down at that endpoint, open up a DOS prompt and see if I could ping something. Yeah. If I couldn't ping, the next thing I'd do is probably reboot that workstation. Of course, I would ensure that all the work was saved on it, at least locally, because yeah. it's not seeing the network, right? Yeah. But it's parsimony. It's use your logic to answer these questions and think, what is the easiest and most efficient course of action in solving these problems? And a lot of people that just have certs, they don't think through a problem in, the, in that manner in order to solve it expeditiously, right? Our job as per particularly this person probably going to go into a tech support of some area is to solve these problems as rapidly as possible, close those help desk tickets and move on. And if a device can't print, it may be a driver, but if nothing changed on that, there's a good question. What's changed between when it worked and when it doesn't? People don't think like that, right? I installed this plug into my email. Was it an authorized installation? No, it came in through a piece of email. Well, that's a good piece of knowledge for the technician to have. Shut that thing off. Re-image it as soon as you can, or pull all the data off when it's isolated from the network. Those are all important questions. And, and, and my point is, listen more than you talk, which is not obvious based on this interview. <laughs> But, but, but try to get a handle on, on really, 
you know, all that relevant information before you solve an issue. But, but certainly if you think this, de this workstation is passing out uh, malware of some sort, get it off the network immediately. Okay, well, Ma, I want to be respectful of your time. I guess we've been talking for a while now. I could, well, it's 20 minutes already. Oh, but me, I'm flew a by. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I'll wrap up here. So thanks very much for your time. Oh, I really appreciate it. And we're, I think, going to have a beer later on. Sounds hopefully. Like a plan. Yeah. Okay. And okay, for everybody else, I'll, I'll probably have some more interviews coming from Insight this week. I'll be reporting on the other stuff as well. So, see you in the next video. Thanks. Thank you.